This episode of Mini Tech Scroll is brought to you by Blackbird, a venture capital firm investing in Aussie and Kiwi startups from the very beginning. Blackbird invests in all kinds of technology. So if you've got an idea and want to take it to the next level, check out Blackbird's Giants program. It's a free eight-week program offering one-on-one -on -one mentoring with top founders, operators, and investors. Applications are currently open and close September 7th. So if you're looking for support and mentoring, check out the link in our show notes and get your application in. Hey everyone, and welcome to Mini Scroll, the daily internet culture podcast bringing you the biggest stories from social media, the creator economy, and the digital space every Monday through Thursday, and sometimes Friday. My name is Annabelle and I'm your Wednesday mini tech scroll host and also the deputy editor of the youth digital media brand Centennial World. Welcome back to mini tech scroll. I hope you guys have had a good week so far and are enjoying the new filter on the mic if you're watching. It's a cute little pop of color. I don't really have too much to say at the top of this week's episode other than please remember to rate, review and subscribe and feel free to check out the buy me a coffee link in the description if you're so inclined. But yeah, let's just jump right into the stories because I feel like today is going to be a bit of a long one. The first story we need to talk about is how YouTube has reportedly made enhancements to uploaded videos without telling creators. According to reporting from BBC and The Atlantic, YouTube users have noticed a couple of changes in various videos. They have been subtle, but definitely noticeable. As Alex Reisner explained for The Atlantic, quote, Viewers have noticed extra punchy shadows, weirdly sharp edges, and a smooth out look to footage that makes it look like plastic. Many people have come to the same conclusion. YouTube is using AI to tweak videos on its platform without creator's knowledge. So a guitarist and creator named Rhett Schall also posted a video about this phenomenon around two weeks ago, and it's currently sitting at almost 800K views at the time of recording, so it has clearly piqued everyone's interest. In the description of the video, he wrote, quote, I recently noticed my videos look strange and smeary on YouTube compared to Instagram, almost like a cheap deep fake. In this video, I investigate what's going on and why I believe it to be a massive problem for everyone on this platform. And that's exactly what he did. There were a couple sections in the YouTube videos, but in one of them, he spoke to his wife, who also happens to be a professional photographer, and she agreed that many of his YouTube short videos looked weirdly smoothed out and kind of had the qualities of an AI-generated image or video. He also pointed to a Reddit thread that was posted two months ago that had the title, quote, YouTube shorts are almost certainly being AI upscaled. And he ended up concluding the video expressing how concerned he is about how his audience would receive these videos thinking that they are AI generated. He said, quote, I think it's going to lead some people to think that I'm using AI to create my videos or that it's been deep faked or that I'm cutting corners somehow. It will inevitably erode viewers trust in my content. With all this speculation going around, YouTube has since gone on to issue a statement on X. On August 21st, YouTube's creator liaison Renee Ritchie clarified that quote, no upscaling was happening. As he wrote, we're running an experiment on select YouTube shorts that uses traditional machine learning technology to unblur, denoise, and improve clarity in videos during processing, similar to what a modern smartphone does when you record a video. So even though Rene Ritchie said that AI wasn't being used, he did cop some backlash from ex-users asking how YouTube could say that it wasn't using AI while simultaneously admitting to using machine learning to improve videos. In a follow-up tweet, Rene Ritchie went on to add some additional context to the terminology he used. As he wrote, quote, Gen AI typically refers to technologies like transformers and large language models, which are relatively new. Upscaling typically refers to taking one resolution and making it look good at a higher resolution. This isn't using Gen AI or doing any upscaling. So I thought this back and forth was quite interesting, not necessarily because of what YouTube is doing, but because it prompted a conversation around whether users actually know what is and what isn't AI, because AI at the end of the day has become such a catch-all term online. In this case, it seems like there's been some confusion between AI and machine learning. For context, AI is obviously a very broad term, but it refers to using technologies to build machines and computers that kind of mimic human intelligence. Whereas machine learning is an application of AI that allows a machine or system to learn and improve from experience. Obviously, the two are really closely related, so the confusion is definitely understandable and valid. 
But it doesn't help that so many companies are adopting AI to feed into the buzz, which makes it even harder to differentiate the two for people who aren't necessarily familiar with this kind of stuff. And you could argue that this is all a matter of semantics, but I think Rhett Scholl's point about AI eroding trust in viewers definitely holds weight here. Reactions to AI on social media are so often pretty intense, and when people start to assume that everything is AI-generated or is using AI, it undermines the experience, especially when that isn't the case. So I definitely think it is important for journalists, experts, influencers to make an effort to explain to their audiences about the differences between AI and machine learning and all stuff like that. Okay, the next story I wanted to talk about is honestly quite an extensive one, and it's all about how Google recently released a study analyzing the environmental impact of AI. So today we are becoming women in STEM, for real. To preface though, I don't want to pretend that I am some kind of expert in this field or kind of analysis, but I definitely have done my very best to provide a high-level breakdown for you guys, especially because I think the environmental impacts of AI is definitely something we should all be very conscious of when we choose to use AI or when we don't. On August 22nd, the Google Cloud blog posted a piece with the headline, How much energy does Google's AI use? We did the math where they reportedly measured the environmental impact of AI inference. Inference in this context, though, is basically running an already trained model to generate an output, so that doesn't necessarily include training. And that is definitely something to note. Anyway, in the blog, they link to a technical paper that explains how they measured the energy emissions and water impact of Gemini prompts. One of the key findings that has stirred up quite a lot of conversation online was that a typical Gemini text query uses 0.24 watt hours of energy, emits 0.03 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent, and consumes 0.26 milliliters or around five drops of water. They also estimated that 12 months ago, the per query energy use was around 33 times higher than it is now. For this episode, I wanted to hone in on the water aspect here, given that there have definitely been concerns for a long time about AI's quote-unquote excessive water consumption. For example, a piece that I found that was published in the conversation last year noted how AI uses large volumes of water related to hardware production, where this usually involves mining for rare materials that ultimately contribute to water pollution. The authors also added, quote, Initial research shows that AI has a significant water footprint. It uses water both for cooling the servers that power its computations and for producing the energy it consumes. On top of this, there's also been research that has been published that indicate that a lot of water is being used in data centers and the training phases of AI models. One study I found while researching for this episode that was actually published back in 2023 found that, quote, the water footprint of AI models can vary widely depending on the complexity of the model and the size of the data center required to run it. For example, GPT-3, an AI model developed by OpenAI, reportedly consumed approximately 700,000 liters of water during its training phase. This is a staggering amount of water, particularly when one considers that GPT-3 is only one AI model among many. So that's just a little bit of context about what has been said and what is believed about AI's water usage. Obviously, it's fair to say that the amount of water used depends on the model and the company. And most of these studies have used ChatGPT as an example, as opposed to Google Gemini. But the pre-existing public narrative and assumptions stand in stark contrast to what Google has published in this recent report slash study. Obviously, this could be a result of technological improvements and efficiency as AI becomes more advanced. But experts are not convinced that this is entirely the case, so I wanted to break that down for you. According to reporting for The Verge, journalist Justine Kalmer notes that the study, quote, omits some key data. Speaking to experts, Kalma notes that the study's decision to exclude, quote, indirect water usage is a problem here. So from my understanding, water usage should include direct consumption, which is water that could be used for cooling the systems, as well as indirect consumption, which would be water used in electricity production, say. As she writes, quote, a big issue experts flag is that Google emits indirect water use in its estimates. Its study included water that data centers use in cooling systems to keep servers from overheating. Now attention is shifting to how much more electricity data centers might need to accommodate new AI models. 
In fact, a majority of the water a data center consumes stems from its electricity use, which Google overlooks in this study. Another article I read from the MIT Technology Review noted that the Google report was also strictly limited to text prompts. So it doesn't necessarily represent the amount of electricity or water needed to generate an image or video, which would presumably be higher. But both of the articles from The Verge and the MIT Technology Review note other factors about the report that should definitely be noted when you're reading it. But we don't have time to get into all of this now, especially if we want this podcast to stay under 15 minutes long. But I would definitely recommend giving those articles a read if you're interested in this topic. Okay. So with all of that, let's take a moment to think of this from a bigger picture perspective. There are a lot of positives, of course, to Google releasing this report. This is definitely the most transparent that a company has been about the environmental impacts of their AI. Even as third-party organizations and researchers try to examine this themselves, there is definitely a veil of secrecy that kind of exists around a company's AI, so it's useful for data to be coming from the company themselves. But I will say I did see one post on Blue Sky that was skeptical of this, and I thought it was a valid point. So as they wrote, quote, letting Google set the narrative about environmental costs of AI is like letting tobacco companies set the narrative about the effects of secondhand smoke by measuring the health effects of sitting through one neighbor's smoking cigarette. I definitely think there is some truth to this, and I also think it is healthy to approach these kind of things with some level of skepticism. Also, the fact that the report was quite transparent with its methodology, despite some of the issues that experts have laid out, helps contextualize how AI factors into our personal carbon footprint. I saw an interesting article from the sustainability by the numbers substack about all of this. As the author Hannah Ritchie explains, quote, individual usage of ChatGPT and other LLMs for most people is a small part of their carbon and energy footprint. Although the fact that AI chatbots are a small part of most individual footprints does not mean I don't think AI and data centers as a whole are not a problem for energy use and carbon emissions. I would also recommend giving that post a read as well. It was really interesting. She even drew comparisons of the energy used to generate one text post would be like compared to watching TV or microwaving food. So I just thought it was interesting to put it into perspective because it can be quite difficult to conceptualize all this for sure. All in all though, I definitely think this kind of reporting is something we should be expecting and demanding from big tech. It's something that I think users are owed since we are the ones using various AI products, especially if you are environmentally conscious or this is something you care about. We deserve to have some answers, I think. And in an era where everything is changing so rapidly, it might just bring a little bit of comfort. Okay, my last story for today is a little bit of a quick one. I feel like the first two stories today were extensive, or at least they took me a while to research, so it felt extensive. But I wanted to quickly mention Rolling Stone's 25 most influential creators of 2025 and how a VTuber was actually in the list. Lauren will actually speak more about the drama that has ensued since this article came out tomorrow, so definitely stay tuned for that. But if you aren't familiar with what a VTuber or virtual YouTuber is, I will explain quickly. So these are essentially virtual content creators who are using avatars to produce content and entertain their audiences. They have been around for a while now and are popular in certain niches online, but I think with this, we are seeing them slowly enter the mainstream or at least internet culture mainstream. Iron Mouse, who is a Puerto Rican Twitch creator, was listed as number 17 in Rolling Stone's list. Quote, Puerto Rican Twitch creator Iron Mouse may remain anonymous, but she's become iconic for her pink and purple head avatar and high-pitched squeaking voice alone. The vlogger and gamer is a mainstay in VTubing and the most subscribed female Twitch streamer of all time. This isn't actually the first time that Iron Mouse has entered the mainstream recently. Around a month ago, Iron Mouse was making headlines after releasing a video alleging that VTuber talent agency V Shoujo was withholding money in funds that were meant to go to charity. In that video, she also announced that she was leaving V Shoujo. This was massive news for the VTubing community at the time and also probably helped this community go a little bit more mainstream in terms of internet culture because that's kind of what drama does. Everyone loves to know what is going on in various niches, even if you aren't deeply invested in it, or at least that might just be me. (laughs) 
But it's definitely interesting to see this niche become increasingly well-known across internet culture. I mean, I was listening to the There Are No Girls on the Internet podcast the other day, which is an iHeart podcast, and they were talking about VTubers selling out concerts. And I haven't really seen VTuber discourse in so many more traditional publications or mainstream publications. But I'm curious, for any of you who have long watched VTubers, are you feeling this shift towards the mainstream at all? And if you are, I'm curious what you think about it. Is this something that you think will last? Is this something that you're enjoying? You're happy to see your favorite creators validated? I'm very curious. Okay, that was everything from mini tech scroll today. I feel like we had quite a variety of stories. Obviously, a lot of it was AI because that is everything we seem to talk about these days. But I will be back with another episode next week and Lauren will speak to you for a regular mini scroll tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Bye.